Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Thanks so much for giving us some of your time today, listeners. You know, this is going to be a good one, which of course I say that every week, but <gasps> I am talking with Nicole Will, and we are discussing how to prevent caregiver burnout, which is super, super important. So thanks for joining me, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to join you. This is going to be awesome. Awesome. Well, why don't you give the audience your your who you are, your background, all the good stuff, and then we can dive right in and t- into preventing burnout. Yeah, absolutely. So I merged my two worlds together, really, quite honestly. I've got a background in senior living, and I also have a background in family caregiving. My grandma came to live with me when I was 15 years old. So we cared for her until her passing. She was this super outgoing woman. She was like cheered the loudest at all of our sporting events. In fact, my mom would get so embarrassed that she like (laughs) wouldn't (laughs) sit next to her. (laughs) She was like, grandma was like too much for everybody. Uh, She was one of my closest friends and we moved houses as a family to a accommodate grandma moving in. So here I was starting high school and a lot of change. And then grandma needed to live with us. So it really was this unique time in our life as we learned what caring for family looks like, how you overcome some of that burnout, different things we can do. And uh, also on the professional side, working in a senior living community, you experience so many emotions and you're in not only a professional setting, but you're also, uh, I believe when we do care, we are very tied to it emotionally. So there are a lot of emotions that happen. And my background was in gerontology and I decided to take the tools that I had working with families working in a more professional senior living setting and start my own company called Will Gather. So we elevate and uh, enhance the well-being of our aging community. We believe that equipping them with information and resource, we do that through the podcast, which is navigating the world with your aging loved one and our mission to raise awareness for caregivers with our boutique gift shop, Gigi Betty Co., named after my grandma, who was instrumental in me understanding those family caregiver dynamics. So I think, and you would know this too, Jennifer, right? Families, we feel empowered when we have information. And so uh, our podcast elevates those initiatives and support. We interview different experts and CEOs. And uh, while our focus is... Um, on different aspects of caregiving. So whether it's financial, emotional, uh, family dynamics, legal, kind of all of the things that encompass that. Uh, And then our caregiver gift shop. So that is a sum up of a little bit of what I'm up to, but I'm just really happy to be able to be here with you today and share um, more about all of the things. (laughs) All of the things. So what was your what was the reason your ne- grandmother needed care? Was it just yes. aging or did she have some form of dementia? Yeah. So I, you know, my grandma, it was, it evolved over time. So in the beginning, my grandma needed support more emotionally and uh, in her lifestyle. So she ended up, uh, getting divorced from my grandfather, quite honestly. (laughs) And her whole life changed after being married for, oh my gosh, I think it was like 40 years or something. And so she really needed the support system of a family. But as she progressed in her aging, uh, she needed that more physical support. She had some spinal surgeries that really debilitated her. But then she also uh, ended up uh, living with dementia. So towards the end, so we, 
experienced it all, quite honestly, from how do you uh, show up in care of someone who's going through life changes as we age. I always say we think of older adults, I think sometimes as um, maybe so not as resilient as they are, but when I really look at it, they are so resilient. When you think about the amount of change, right? Change from uh, going from raising family to retirement to possibly marriage situation, health, uh, living situations change. It's like, oh my gosh, these are such courageous people that are dealing with change so much. Yeah. My, my paternal grandmother said, aging is not for wimps. She's the one that lived to 103. <laughs> oh my and her, gosh. Her mom in 1978 got mm-hmm. a pacemaker. Mm-hmm. Now, my so my great grandmother traveled across the country in a covered wagon, lived mm-hmm. in a dugout. She was the oldest of 14, only got to school till third grade. For people who are old enough, yes, that sounds like Little House on the Prairie. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't, as a young child, I wasn't super interested in great grandma's stories versus what TV was telling. Cause obviously TV was a little bit more entertaining, which right. is kind of a bummer, but <laughs> she got this pacemaker and because she could feel it, she was just like, she literally gave up the ghost. And there was mm-hmm. multiple times in my grandmother's life that I kind of thought, oh, this might be the end. Her spouse, my grandfather died at the end of 97. They'd been married for almost, uh, they got married in 38. I'll let you guys do the math. It's yeah. too early for me to do math. <laughs> I know. We got to the, so that must have been almost 60 years. Mm-hmm. And um, then in two, she'd had glaucoma since I was 12. In 2005, she fell. She damaged the retina on the good eye. So she was almost fully blind. Kind of figured, well, this woman is artistic and loves to read and is very visual. So that'll be the end of that. Nope. It wasn't that. Then she got really hard of hearing at about 101. So that was in 2020, 2019, somewhere around there, 2019, I think. And then she had to move into a board and care home. Now, my paternal grandmother, Nana, was, she had plenty of money to do what needed to be done to hire people. Um, But no, she burned out my aunt. She started having, I guess, mini strokes. And my aunt was just like, I can't do this. And, you know, Nana wouldn't move in with them and she wasn't moving in with Nana. So they moved her to a board and care home. And I thought, well, this is for sure going to be it. And then I found out (gasps) at Thanksgiving last year that she loved the place. And I was like, I swear. (laughs) So, you know, resilience is a choice. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, Um, you know, she hung in there, you know, through the pandemic and you know, like technically the woman lived through both of the pandemics we've had because she was born in 1918, mm-hmm. you know, so it was just, you know, resilience is a choice. That you is know, so, so true. You're right about that because you think of those situations where uh, people don't choose to be resilient. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's not necessarily easy because mm-hmm. there's just times when it's, and I think this happens with caregivers a lot, is we're torn between what's best for say a parent or a spouse versus what's best for us. And sometimes those don't match up and it's really hard to, to find that balance. So that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, like I know caregivers who are caring for two parents that need, you know, care. And, you know, one parent's like, you know, we're not getting help. It's your responsibility. And it's like, the hell it is. Not 100%, not 24-7 for Lord knows how many years, because my mom had Alzheimer's for 20. You know, my paternal grandmother lived to 103. I don't think my aunt expected that. (laughs) No, no, you don't. You don't. Yeah. And when you were saying that that's what your aunt had said, my grandma said the same thing. She would always say growing old is not for sissies. (laughs) Yep. And it is, that is the truth. But yeah, that is the truth. So yeah. how would you counsel this caregiver that I know who both parents have some form of cognitive um, disability and one parent is like absolutely refuses to, to bring in any other additional help other than the daughter. And, you know, she's at her wits end. She's literally burning out. Now she's not taking advantage of some of the things we've already suggested, which is 
frustrating, but maybe it's because, you know, she's, it's like one more thing is not what she wants to add to her plate. So how do right. we, <laughs> right. how do we help her shift the, <laughs> yeah. the focus and the priorities? Oh, I know. Well, I always tell caregivers first that I think while we don't want to be Pollyanna about it, right. And never acknowledge the hardness or, or, or what is that? Not toxic positivity. Right. But I think that what is hard about that is that we have to acknowledge the hard stuff and give it a voice so that we can address it. But we also can't live in the negativity of it because then that's where our mindset is. And we're going to get so bogged down when we're always focusing on the negative. So uh, my lens is that I think we have to start by having compassion for ourselves and know that we are in a situation where we will feel stressed and burnt out and overwhelmed and that we can't feel guilty for needing to prioritize our own needs. And that I also was listening to um, a psychologist talk about if we're in those situations that are hard and we're not feeling overwhelmed or stressed, then something's wrong, right? <laughs> like we're, we have to acknowledge that we're having a normal emotional reaction to the situation that we're in. And I think sometimes we try to, we forget that. And we try to say like, everything's fine. I'm going to be fine. I, I, you know, we, we want to be happy in life, which is understandable. But I also think it's important that we have to acknowledge, okay, we are having an enormous <laughs> emotional response to the situation that we're in. So uh, acknowledging that is a huge piece of it. Uh, for your, for your uh, friend that's in that situation, I think that one tool that's worked with some family members is that when they're resistant to having other people come into their home, you mentioned that was that the mom was saying no one else is coming in to help me except for you. Uh, one way around this that we found to be successful is that rather than approach it from we're hiring a professional caregiver to come in that you don't know, which can feel very invasive, we've approached it from hey, I've got a really good friend that's driving by. They're just going to pop in and visit with me for a little bit. And we started out having this dynamic be where it was someone that needed to stop by, wanted to fill some time and have a visit. And as that dynamic grew and the loved one became more comfortable with that other friend in the home... Uh, that acceptance then of, oh, actually, you know what I do? Could you help me with this? I've got some laundry or I've got um, a show. Can I keep you company? And we kind of shifted the dynamic that the person stopping by really needed that uh, friend and support. And so when we shifted it like that, then the older adult really felt like, they had purpose and helping this person uh, adjust to the neighborhood, feel, fill some of their time, um, fill their loneliness. And that dynamic of shifting for the older adult to find purpose and supporting that other person started the process of this then friend being able to come into the home regularly and provide support, and it eventually shifted to then full-time care that the loved one now relied on and was super excited about. So that is just a practical application of how do we <laughs> address that specific concern? And it helped the family so much because the family was primarily caregiving long distance and really needed uh, that help to come inside the home and to be able to offer some of those uh, support systems. So I also feel like um, there is just the component of when we're caregiving, it's physically and emotionally draining. And so it's essential for us and for your friend that if we do not prioritize 
ourselves, and we hear this all the time, it's easier said than done. We can't provide the best care possible, right? Um, And Mm -hmm. I was reading something that said, if we don't rest when we can rest, our body is going to decide when that time is, and it will most likely be inconvenient. (laughs) Definitely true there. Yes, yes. So I think of it, okay, if I have control and autonomy on when I get to take those breaks, when it maybe fits into my schedule as much as we can have a schedule, (laughs) then I've got a little bit more control over that than when my body and my mental health burns out and it's so inconvenient. So I, I think setting us up with that perspective of let's then have some parameters around that. So we have control because caregiving is a massive loss of control. It is not uh, something a lot of us typically say, oh, hey, yes, I want to do this. You know, and, you know, the term caregiver burnout, um, it is common in the world of caregiving. We hear the term, but what does that really mean? Um, And it is that we're chronically in a state of that exhaustion, whether it's emotional, physical, mental, and it's prolonged over time. Um, We have so much stress and negativity. Um, We know that the data supports that a lot of caregivers health declines when they're in that caregiver role, um, more so than their loved one. So we know that if we don't manage the stress, we will be having further negative consequences uh, down the road. And there's a ripple effect. It affects our children, our spouses, our friends. It affects (laughs) everything. Everything Everything around us. Yes, it does. I mean, it, it can affect your community because you're unable to participate in, you know, community building things. Like if you're part of a service organization or a religious community, You just don't have the time to like reach out. You don't have the time and you certainly did not want to reach out to help anybody else. Yeah. You know, and I've said for a long time until big corps realize that dementia caregivers are already affecting their bottom line. Mm -hmm. Not enough is going to change in this country. Mm -hmm. And to kind of speak to the chronic fatigue and negativity and stress. um, I don't remember if it was you, but a Mm -hmm. recent person I was speaking to basically updated the statistic on caregivers who pass away before their loved one. It used to be 30%, which is bad enough, but now it's 50%. And if you're over 65, I think the you the rate of people that pass away before the person they're caring for goes up even more. So this is it's, a very terrible statistic. It is. It's staggering. It's staggering. Yeah. Well, and when you think of what what that burnout is and then how it affects us. It is deeply impacts our sleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it deeply impacts our sleep because when you think about that role full time, we are pro- possibly and more more frequently up in the evening. We're not getting sleep through the night. There's so much more data coming out about how sleep impacts our brain health. Uh, it If we're not getting adequate sleep, we um, are not preventing dementia in our own health. And so there's just so much data. Uh, Not only is it physically demanding with stress, right, on our on our uh, vital organs, Uh, but just the one factor of sleep alone um, is is staggering. And then when we are in high stress situations, our potential to maybe use alcohol or other uh, mechanisms to cope that are not always beneficial for our health. Um, I just interviewed a, a neuropsychologist about dementia prevention and just how that plays a role. So as we're looking at um, the things we typically lean on when we are stressed and overwhelmed tend to not maybe be as great for our health to your point of, you know, obviously the the stats on um, passing away um, before our loved one that we're caring for. So 
how do we do that in a way that that is constructive? <laughs> it's definitely yeah. my my stress stress release is doing something creative. Mm-hmm. I like to make homemade greeting cards. And recently there was a day it was just like, like, I don't know, the world was just determined to frustrate the crap out of me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have enough time to actually create, but mm-hmm. I just got out the pieces, parts and the different things and kind of looked at like, you know, when I have a few more minutes, like over the weekend or whatever, you know, what, what's some options for whatever it was I was thinking of, like, you know, yeah. Halloween or Christmas or um, birthday. and just that like 20 minutes of just mm-hmm. messing, just, just like getting out the tools and looking at them and then putting them all away. I was like, okay, now I feel slightly less frustrated yeah. with the entire world. <laughs> it is amazing how just something simple yeah. can really help. And one of the, the coping techniques, like mm-hmm. how to start learning boundaries, how to mm-hmm. start putting, you know, putting your own needs into mm-hmm. your, you know, already mm-hmm. overwhelmed schedule mm-hmm. is to schedule five minutes every day just for you. And it's mandatory. Yeah. You can take these five minutes, you're going to read something, you're going to, you know, sip a, sip tea or coffee, whichever mm-hmm. caffeinated beverage of choice you prefer, <laughs> um, not alcohol. Um, that's not a good idea. You know, or just, you know, maybe doodle on a notepad, whatever, whatever you can do mm-hmm. in five minutes mm-hmm. that just kind of releases your brain and once you've conquered every day you've got five minutes that's all yours uninterrupted yeah. Yeah. you know now up it to 10 so do you have other suggestions kind of along that line like most of us get into caregiving because mm-hmm. of a family emergency like you guys had um i had mm-hmm. and we make adjustments the crisis is over and we think, okay, now we can go back to quote normal. Well, pff, that's right. never going to happen. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And, and then normal, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you keep putting in, you know, <clears throat> tricks and mechanisms and, and mm-hmm. you know, workarounds until you get to the point where it's like the person just needs so much more help mm-hmm. that none of the, you know, you can't do it from a distance. You can't make a process that, you know, like reminders or whatever. And the next thing you know, it's like you go from this one little emergency to, you know, drowning in caregiving and you're like, how the hell did I get here? And yeah. so yeah. I always suggest to people, as soon as you get, ki- once you get through that crisis and you've got a diagnosis, you know what's mm-hmm. going on, that is when you should start putting a care team in place. And yeah. I always suggest that my, and people have heard this a lot, but I'm going to keep telling it until everybody does it. I know. The, the fastest and easiest way to to put a care team in place and avoid the whole I don't want strangers in my home mm. is to make a list of everybody, you know, and all of their, um, their best traits. Like, mm-hmm. please don't ask me to call insurance companies. Just the thought <laughs> of that stresses me out. Can't do it. Don't like, no, nope. I yeah. will do it if you really need me to, but I can make food. I can take, you know, do driving. I can do a lot of things, but please don't ask me to do that. Yes. One. Yeah. Um, and then the other side of the coin is to write down like spend a week writing down, okay, Monday, here's mm-hmm. all of the things I have to do on Mondays. Here's all the things I have to do on Tuesday. Make a list of all of the things you need to do to maintain the household, to maintain yourselves, you know, add in the random doctor's appointments, the random, you know, personal appointments. And now now you've got a list of things that need to be done and a list of people who can do them. <laughs> exactly. And when Nicole says, oh my gosh, Jennifer, I'm so here to, sorry to hear that your dad is in the hospital and he's been caregiving for your mom all these years. Is there anything I can do to help? You have an answer. And the answer is not, mm-hmm. oh, no, it's okay. Thank you. I, I'm fine. Because that we know is baloney. So that is my quick and dirty, you know. So how to put it. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, now you're relying on somebody to, you know, maybe make an occasional meal. Take your loved one out, you know, take them to the, I shouldn't probably say it, dog park. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't get her attention. <laughs> yeah. Um, and whatever, you know, set up online banking, talk mm-hmm. to the insurance companies. Mm-hmm. Now you have more time to do the physical care of your your person, whether it's your spouse yeah. or your parent. So do you have yeah. anything to add to that? Oh or my what? gosh, yes. Those are such great tips. And I always speak to that where 
lean into the support system and their gifts, right? Like you said, don't ask me to do, I don't know, finances or something (laughs) because numbers are like not my strong suit, but I'm amazing at making phone calls and connecting with people in various ways. So, right, lean into those strengths because then your support system is going to want to help you when they're doing things that actually they're good at and they enjoy. Uh, To add to that, I love that. The care team, yes, absolutely. Boundaries is number one. I think scheduling that time and then growing on it, it's super uncomfortable to put boundaries in place in the beginning because we get pushback. People in our lives, I think, like when we don't have boundaries. (laughs) Because then they can, uh, you know, have us all to themselves all the time. So it's practicing having the boundary. And I'll talk more about that. But one of the things that I think is so great as a caregiver, we've talked about how it's this massive loss of control. It's not something we've really chosen. We lose our identity sometimes in that. We just go to that we're in this caregiver role. And there's a woman by the name of Anna Hall who created the purpose equation. And so as a caregiver, We have to understand what gives us purpose and our joy fuel outside of our caregiver role. So what sparks joy for us and then sprinkle that in our day. We have to understand what that is for us and define it. And she talks about how when we do that, then our brains can activate it. And there's a combination of all of these innate elements in all of us, our values, what our natural strengths are. She has this four main categories of purpose. Like, do we find our purpose in movement? Like for me, mine is walking. I love going for a walk every day. It brings me so much joy. Uh, is it adventure? Are we being curious around about our world Uh, we're excited to explore. She talks about that it's not just about risk, but adventure is about uh, showing up with curiosity and things. So for me, I find adventure in exploring new places and travel, a restaurant, meeting a new friend. Um, Is it rest? You know, rest is not uh, lazy or selfish. We do not function well without it. And then one of the other pillars of uh, purpose she mentions is synergy. Are we connecting with um, our spirituality? Is it socially? Are we having these things that fuel us to preserve us through life's hardship? So we have to be able to um, pull from our purpose superpower while we're caring for others by caring for ourselves. And we gain that sense of control after we've lost it in caregiving uh, to be able to then know who we are. So once we go through that exercise of defining our purpose, we can infuse it in our everyday. And so I think that's a massive um, perspective on caring for ourselves and in a lot of ways, overcoming that burnout over time. (laughs) So um, Anna Paul is an amazing person that people need to look more into um, as that scaffolding she talks about. So purpose is that internal scaffolding, scaffolding that is inside of us that will sustain us over a long period of time. So along with those boundaries, along with, um, I really view knowing our purpose and leaning into that is really prioritizing our self-care, which is how we take care of ourselves to get through the burnout we experience when we're, when we have so much output for everybody else (laughs) in our lives, you know, we're managing so many things, um, that it's so important to, um, be able to draw from that. And to do that, we first have to know what that is for ourselves. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. 
learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. That makes sense. Um, I got really, like, I don't want to say lazy, but in the bad habit of during the pandemic. So my mom passed away right at literally March 31st, 2020. And then it was like, well, now we're all just sitting around doing nothing or, you know, not really nothing, but, you know, we're not going places and doing things. And I didn't have to worry about my mom. And so I just I got really bad about just like reading like hundreds of news articles, scrolling social media and like just not doing things. Now, reading's not a bad thing, but sometimes it was like falling down a rabbit hole. So I'm been in the process of being like, no, let's actually do something. And interestingly enough, my nine year old golden retriever has decided that about 830 in the evening is the time we're going to play tug, which I also refer to as rip your arm out of the socket. Yeah. <laughs> because, and she'll play for, you know, a long time. It's like, I have to like toss the toy and hope that she'll get distracted enough to like, maybe just shred it instead of bringing it back to me for some more yank and tug. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. You know, that's better for her and it's better for me than you know, one more social media post that, you know, yes. is not going to change my life. Exactly. Exactly. And I think along with that, we have to not be afraid to ask other people for help or support. And when I, what I mean by that is we'll hear people in our life say, Oh, let me know if you need anything. And we just don't want to take them up on it. Cause it's like, how do I distill down the 20 things that I need (laughs) that sometimes I only feel like I can do. But what I found to be helpful is that bringing someone with you, if you need to go visit your loved one or take them to the doctor's appointment or the grocery store, I've been doing that with a girlfriend of mine that will do things together when we're going to visit someone or take care of someone. And what that does is it makes it, I mean, errands are way better with a friend, right? That's true. (laughs) And reach out and the people in our lives want to help us they just always don't know how and we don't let them. So I always attach it to um, bring someone with you to make those visits um, even more interesting for yourself as a caregiver. You can have more conversation then with your loved one. It changes the dynamic sometimes. You've got support if you're in the store. I think we we limit ourselves by thinking, well, I've just always done it this way. So that's how I'll continue to do it. When I'm challenging us to think about, let's do it differently. What if that is your joy fuel is bringing um, a friend or family with you to do all those things that seem mundane that only you can do that no one else you think is going to want to do. Try it and see how it shifts your mental health um, and your joy around it, you know, and your loved one, your loved one could really actually love the change in dynamic with someone else there. Um, and just to, to try something new. <laughs> I love that <laughs> suggestion. New. I, yeah. I did the exact opposite. So my, when my mom was living <clears throat> in the care home, she, everybody knows this. My mom's name was Diane. She befriended other Diane and they befriended other, other Diane (laughs) as if that's not confusing enough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And because they were kind of the three musketeers or, you know, usually it was the three of them would sit around and talk, but if it was just my mom and one of the other Diane's, 
frequently I'd be like, I would, there was one day I was taking my mom to get her nails done and she's like, oh, can my friend come? And I'm like, okay. And I had taken, so I've, I took other, other Diane to the nail salon to McDonald's because she really needed a burger. And and the first Diane, I took her and my mom to the regional park several times. And it, it was easier for me because they talked to each other. They could obsess over the same, like in the regional park, there was like a picnic area and there was this very steep, um, like it was a man-made like man trampled path. It was not really a path because most of us have to slide down this little hill on our butts. Uh-huh, <laughs> and uh-huh. so these two older women who were moms and grandmas discussed that damn path. Oh, <laughs> and like they wouldn't go down it, but they could see the boys going down it and on uh-huh. and on. And I was just like, this is fascinating. Yeah. And then after a while, I'm over there taking pictures of flowers because I like to do macro shots of flowers. <laughs> And I'm listening to them and I'm thinking, I'm so glad I don't have to have this conversation with my mother. Yeah. Oh, you totally did that in a just a different way. I love that. You just brought along the community. And I think we are social beings. We need that community as people, right? We want that human connection and uh, creating ways to do that and bring those ladies together. You made their day. You could totally yep. make their day. And people thought I was crazy. Like I remember once somebody said, oh, what'd you do with your mom yesterday? I'm like, oh, you know, mom and other Diane, we all went to the regional park that was like literally like 10 minutes from, there was two regional parks, like five and 10 minutes away mm-hmm. from the care home. So you didn't have that whole where are we going after five <laughs> minutes in the car? Which, oh, my mom would pull that like oh, seven to no. 10 minutes in the car. Like, where are we going? Oh, and, just, yeah. and in that really irritating voice, and be like, oh my God, we haven't even been in the car oh, that long. So great. And so it was great that the park was close. And they're like, you took two old women with Alzheimer's <laughs> to the park. I'm like, yeah. And you brought them back. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> the ranger was right there. I couldn't really just leave them there. <laughs> Yes. Oh. I'm sure they would have figured out who I was. So, right. Yeah. Right. And then yes. at you know, in the last year, so the first Diane got really paranoid mm. and then her daughters moved her out of the care home. And other other Diane at in the beginning, mm-hmm. I thought she was a visitor. I mean her mm. hair was perfect, her makeup was perfect. She communicated pretty well, you know, like mm-hmm. like you do with a stranger. Yeah, And it wasn't until, I don't know, like three or four months. And I realized she wasn't a visitor. I was like, oh, wow. But she progressed much mm-hmm. quicker than my mom. Mm-hmm. So she she got to the point where she didn't even see me. Wow. For a while, she's like, you look familiar. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm here all the time. I'm, <laughs> I'm visiting. And I'd point at my mom. No, that's not it. And I'm like, okay, what if you say? <laughs> it's like, oh, and then, she, then I just kind of became invisible yeah. And my mom was much quieter. So we just went to the park and watched kids. You know, it wasn't the easiest thing. My mom's yeah. visual processing was so bad that mm-hmm. she'd watch her feet when she walked. And mm-hmm. getting her to a bench was always mm-hmm. a challenge. But mm-hmm. once we were there, she just loved watching the kids. Oh, so I kind of felt so much energy and joy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And just and the sunshine. She always seemed mm-hmm. like there was just like a slightly brighter spark for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that was just wishful thinking on my part or, oh, I mean, I know they're absolutely a science behind that. We need that sun, not only in our eyes, a uh, Dr. Huberman, I don't know if you've ever heard <laughs> talk to him. He is, a um, oh my gosh, neuro psychiatrist, something he teaches at Stanford. Anyways, he talks a lot about how we need that sun on our face and in our eyes every day to keep our, uh, um, sleep schedule and rhythm and vitamin D. And there's so much science behind that. You absolutely saw the the real spark. Um, and not only that, but I think being in nature is a human right. You know, mm-hmm. we, we don't always, unfortunately, our loved ones that are living with dementia, um, they really need to be having access to the outdoors all of the time. So I'm so glad you did that. That's amazing. Well, mom's care home, basically, uh, if you think of like a square O, mm. in the middle was a courtyard, a beautiful courtyard oh, with um, so you know, nice cushioned yeah. wicker furniture and 
couple other table metal with metal chairs. Those were a little Ooh. annoying. Drag those across the <laughs> cement. Oh, and I can just hear that sound. <laughs> yeah. And that wasn't a really great sound for people who oh, had no. some yeah, form of dementia. Of sound. Yeah. But, you know, it always made me a little sad because in the earlier days, so my mom lived in the care home for three years. You'd go out there and see the three Dianes just mm-hmm. yakking it up and probably mm-hmm. getting into mischief because <laughs> they did do that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know, the first Diane moved out and the other Diane, I don't think she understood where anything was anymore. And I just never saw my mom go out in the courtyard anymore. It was so sad because I mean, it was really nice because it had, you know, like the overhang. So you were shaded. And then mm-hmm. in the middle was um, lawn and some raised um, garden boxes. And mm-hmm. um, it was just, it was, it was really nice. And it made it so all of the hallways were pretty bright too because the care oh, added was... that sunlight yeah because yeah. some of them can feel so dark when you've got the long hallways and mm-hmm. no natural light it's oh yeah yeah so it was mm-hmm. it was a good choice you know um most people know I I didn't pay, I didn't do a lot of research they said my mom could keep her dog and I practically threw the checkbook at them so <laughs> here take my money <laughs> <laughs> whatever was, you need <laughs> i was like i don't necessarily recommend that uh that way of uh, going about it it worked yeah. out great mm-hmm. but you know and i was there all the time you know mm-hmm. and i always treated the them the, the caregivers there mm-hmm. like i was the captain of mom's care team yeah they were you know the important like quarterback players i'm not a football fan so yeah. i can't make very good yeah. analogies there yeah. but you know i was i was in charge but not I wasn't necessarily the boss. We all, we were all there to take care of my mom. So. Together, yeah. 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 And I think that helped because they knew they could rely on me. I knew I could mm-hmm. rely on them. So that mm-hmm. that helped my burnout a lot. There was, mm-hmm. there was a funny story. My mom would, at the end of her life, got real feisty. The more help she needed, the less she would accept. And mm-hmm. she literally clawed people and drew blood. Wow. And there was one day she, I got her to walk around the building and she, and she wouldn't walk arm in arm. She wouldn't walk next to me. It was a whole thing. Mm-hmm. I actually have a past guest that diagnosed why that was. Mm. Um, she was the oldest of four. So was walking behind the siblings kept that allowed mm. her to keep an eye on them. It just was not safe, in my humble opinion. And I finally got her to walk arm in arm with me. And after a while, it irritated her. She told me to drop dead. And she literally tried to scratch me. And so I grabbed her wrists. And I'm like, no, we're not going to do that. You know, we're having wow. a nice afternoon. We're not going to do that. Yeah. And she was just, oh my God, yeah. if, the, if looks could kill, I would have been poof. You got right one, yes. Oh. Yeah, I would have been dead three mm. times over that day. And then she got more angry, I guess. I'm not really sure why. Mm-hmm. And she tried to scratch me again. I'm like, that's it. I literally, mm-hmm. you know, hauled her off the bench, mm-hmm. opened the door, punched the coat in, shoved her in, slapped the door and walked away. And <laughs> they were like, they'd like seen that. some of that interaction. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, you weren't too happy with her. I'm like, no, I'm not going to put up with that crap. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not going to hurt people just because we're mm-hmm. we're not getting our way. So, mm-hmm. but it was funny because mm-hmm. I didn't know that they saw that. <laughs> oh, well, you know, the separation was good. You both mm-hmm. needed time and space. <laughs> and that was and the it, perfect response. Yeah. Yeah. And she, I'm sure she forgot about it two minutes in, but it took mm-hmm. me a few days not to be ticked off. Yeah. Yeah. I know. But, but that's a good point is like, you know, mm-hmm. you get on each other's nerves. I'm like, we're not with our spouses 24 mm-hmm. seven. Thank God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> completely so, yeah we you know, would it's be not natural right we would be um oh there was such a great analogy that i had learned about that where in relationship dynamics okay right okay marriage relationships is it a marriage issue or is it just a roommate issue because 99% of our issues with people are like roommate right we're living we're spending so much time together you're just going to deal with stuff and same for caregiving Is it truly a relationship dynamic within our caregiving or is it just the fact that we're roommates and live together and we're overcoming just being with someone that much? (laughs) And when we can distinguish, okay, this is probably would be a dynamic I would have with anybody that I'm this 
close to and spending this much time with, that it's not as personal as within that relationship dynamic. And so when we can distinguish that, it helps us not take everything so personal. Like, oh, I would get annoyed with anyone that would leave their dishes in the sink every day, multiple times a day. Right. Yep. (laughs) You know, uh, not just this one person is, you know, my nemesis or whatnot. So I think it helps us go, okay, like, yes, this is just because we're spending this much time together. (laughs) Um, That's been something that's helped me in different relationships is not personalizing it so much. And then, of course, you have those issues that are personal, that are unique to that specific relationship based on uh, past family dynamics. Uh, whether trauma is involved, that can be more complicated, Um, whether there needs to be more an establishment of boundaries, um, communication, right? So that you can kind of deep dive in like where, where does this conflict or frustration really lie within the dynamic? And then I think that helps us get to resolving it. That makes sense. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Like my husband's really good at walking past the dishwasher put the plates on the (laughs) counter and then he'll walk the dog and then come back and do the dishes i'm like like it's it's the same amount of and and i just get up and put them in the dishwasher i'm not gonna (laughs) drop them on the counter but it's like whatever whatever works for you i try not to you know i try try really hard not to expect people to do things the way i do them because that's just even though it would benefit everybody if they would just do it my way. <laughs> exactly. That's such a perfect example. That's a roommate issue, yep. not like a fundamental marriage relationship issue. So I love that. That's such a perfect uh, example of that. <laughs> yeah, I just look at it and shake my yeah. head and think, you know, mm-hmm. gosh, you'd have more time if you didn't, yeah. dump, you know, like basically you're you're adding to the amount of time it takes because now you have to pick them up again and open the shit. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's just so dumb. <laughs> makes me crazy. Oh, totally. I know. If everyone just did what we wanted them to. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> my way is so logical. Right. Just do it yeah. my way. <laughs> I know. And they're probably thinking the same thing. Like, why don't they just do it the way I do? You know, it's, it's like, like it's we no all big have deal. our perspective. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. So do you have any last advice for caregivers? We've really given people a huge chunk to think about so efforts to not not give too much too much advice all at once too much (laughs) you know I think overall maybe identify what your most urgent need is first um I think it's easy for us to go oh I need okay I need community I need support I need to take care of my physical health you know we want to go to all of the things that we might need. And that can then be another stressor. So I think identifying for people, what's the most urgent need? You know what? I'm really not getting sleep right now. I'm going to focus on that and focus on that first and then move on to the next thing. You know what? I really need to figure out what my purpose is because that's going to bring me joy. Then do that. Um, It is not, I heard someone say, this is the marathon of caregiving. Unfortunately, it is not uh, a quick race. Nope. <laughs> and so when we are in a marathon, we have to build that endurance and stamina and have patience, right? We're practicing every day. When you go on your run, you you build on the miles. You might start with one and then you do two. And so understanding that we're not going to get everything done at that, at that one time. And that's okay. So practice compassion for yourself. Um, start with one thing at a time. What's most urgent, uh, build in those systems that make you feel like you've got the internal scaffolding to support you through this marathon. Um, but then also the support system. So that is my end note. (laughs) That is my end. Yes. And listen to podcasts, right? Fading Memories, yep. uh, mine. There's some other great ones out there. And when you feel like you've got some good tips and information and people are with you in it and you are not alone, guess what? You're going to feel like you can do so much more in the world in your caregiving. So, um, and you can do it on the go. Put in the AirPod oh, yeah. while you're caregiving in your car with your yep. friend. Yeah. <laughs> My mom was always a talk radio listener talk tv 
And I did all the things trying to connect with music. Should have just connected with podcasts because Mm -hmm. I think my mom would have actually loved them if she had been, you know, cognitively um, fine, you know, in the later stages of her life. Yeah. So tell me the name of your show again so people can find that one as well. Yes, it is Navigating the World with Your Aging Loved One. It is the Will Gather podcast um, available on all the platforms. And I started listening to podcasts when I would do dishes or fold laundry because I really did not enjoy doing that. And I felt like if I'm going to do something this mundane every day because dishes and laundry never go away, (laughs) I'm going to at least enjoy myself and I'm going to learn something and I'm going to be entertained. So, um, those tasks that we have to do that we don't like, make it fun for yourself in whatever way that is. It honestly gets me through. So, Yep. And it's, yeah. you can listen to podcasts <laughs> while you're doing all the caregiving all things. All the things. Yes. Yep. Well, this has been fantastic. I appreciate this. And I hope everybody checks out um, Nicole's podcast and her website. All that's linked in the show notes. And I'm also going to link, if I find it, the Anna Hall um yeah the purpose, purpose equation equation there we go because Amazing. that sounds that sounds really interesting and yes I'm you'll have person. to have her on your podcast because she's amazing and would be so encouraging for your your listeners too yeah thank you that's a great suggestion yeah. and i will definitely check into it sounds good thank you Thanks. for having me you're welcome fading memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts